As a kid, I was always fascinated with history. I read about it, I watched documentaries, but now I want to visit and walk the ground of those historic places that I've spent years studying. Join me on my trek, History Adventures. In this episode of History Adventures, we're at the Little Bighorn Battlefield. In previous episodes, we have followed the battle. It is now late in the day on June 25th, 1876. Custer and his command have been wiped out, and the men with Reno and Benteen have been driven back from Weir Point. The men with Reno and Benteen have set up a defensive position in what is now known as the Reno-Benteen Battlefield and prepare for attacks from the Indian warriors. With that, let's take a look at this episode. Reno and Benteen return to the area where they first encountered each other earlier in the day. A depression at the top of the ridge. The troops take up a position on the higher edges, forming a circular defensive position with Benteen and his troops out on a ridge. The horses, mules, and wounded are gathered in the lower center section. The Indian warriors continue over Weir Point and towards the troops' defensive position. From what is known as Sharpshooter's Ridge, warriors fire into the defensive position, hitting the men, horses, and mules. More warriors arrive in the area and surround the troops. Crazy Horse and many of his warriors believe that the troops will retreat from this area and head back to what is known as Reno Creek, the route that they used to approach the village earlier in the day. Crazy Horse, with his warriors, set up an ambush near the area of the Lone Teepee. Surrounded, the troops would not move from their defensive positions. As darkness fell over the battlefield, the warriors fired into the troops before heading back towards the village. The warriors would keep small groups surrounding the troops all night. The troops made use of the cover of darkness to fortify their positions. Others that were exhausted fell asleep. When you walk around the Reno-Benteen battlefield area, you can still see some of these dugout areas that the troops used for cover. From high on the ridges, the troops could see down into the village. They could hear drums beating, fires were all around the village, cheering, yelling, and the firing of weapons were all night long. June 26th, 1876. Around 4 a.m., the sky begins to lighten up. At 5 a.m., John Martin sounded reveille for the troops to get up and be ready in their positions. The warriors with captured bugles replied with just blowing bugle sounds. During the early morning, and still under the cover of darkness, Many warriors moved from the village up Deep Ravine and took positions near the Benteen defensive position. The warriors were close enough that they could hit the soldiers with dirt clods. Just before 7 a.m., the firing along the line begins to pick up in intensity. Benteen, seeing that his line was being pressured by warriors moving closer, decides to make a charge. The troops charge towards the warriors and scatter them. The troops return to their original positions, believing that they have pushed the warriors back, relieving the pressure on their lines but the warriors quickly return and the fighting continues. Benteen searches for reinforcements and returns to his line with a few more men. The reinforcements take up a position along the line. The warriors continue to move closer, getting as close as 75 feet to the troops. In this area, the warrior named Long Road is killed by the troops. A memorial marker identifies the area he was killed. With the warriors getting closer to the lines again, Benteen orders another charge. The troops make another charge into the warriors and scatter them. The troops clear the area almost 100 yards out from their lines and quickly return to their original positions. Again, the warriors slowly return and take up positions closer to the troops' defensive lines. The fighting continues all along the defensive perimeter. At roughly 11 a.m., Benteen orders his men to again charge into the warriors and drive them from the area. The troopers charge, clearing the area, and they also drive the warriors from the deep ravine that they had been using to move towards Benteen's defenses. With Benteen's charge, all along the defensive lines, troopers move forward, but most only move forward roughly 20 yards and then quickly return to their original lines. From the morning fighting, casualties begin to mount. The men have been without water now for a substantial amount of time. At the field hospital, Dr. Porter lets Reno and Benteen know that without water, men are going to start to die. Benteen, knowing that the ravine has been cleared, asks for volunteers to go to the river and get water. Nineteen men volunteer to get water. With sharpshooters providing cover for the men, they race down the ravine and get to the river and collect water. Some of the men made multiple runs for water. Many of the soldiers getting water and some of the sharpshooters would earn the Medal of Honor for their actions. The warriors seem to fall back and their overall firing on the troops seems to slow around noon. The warriors regroup and plan their next attack. 
Around this time, warrior scouts have spotted the columns of Terry's troops moving towards the village from the north. At approximately 2 p.m., the warriors attack Reno and Benteen's men with a large volley of fire and then quickly withdrew from the area back to their village. With the new troops moving towards the village, Sitting Bull and the village elders decide it is time to leave the area and not risk the women and children again. From high on the bluffs, the troopers could see the activity in the village. A short time later, the grass in the valley was set on fire. A wall of smoke blocked the view of the troops up on the ridge. The entire village began to move out of the area. Crow scouts reached Terry's troops and informed them of the defeat of Custer, but the men could not believe that such a thing could have happened. Terry's column could see the smoke and thought that Custer was burning the village and continued to move towards the battlefield. Terry sent out scouts to investigate. They saw what they believed was Custer's troops but were attacked by Indian warriors. Terry and his men form a defensive position and prepare for an attack. The men held their position as darkness was coming. They were approximately one mile from Last Stand Hill. Reno and Benteen had their men start burying the dead. The men were now able to move towards the river and get water. Some cared for the remaining horses. As darkness began to fall on the battlefield, miraculously, survivors of the Reno charge on the 25th that had been hiding in the timber returned to the reno Benteen defensive lines. The men maintained their defensive position the remainder of the night. Early on June 27, 1876, Gibbon and Terry's men awoke and began moving towards the battlefield. From high on the ridge, Reno and Benteen could see the dust from the columns of troops. As Gibbon and Terry's troops arrived on the battlefield, the truth of the Custer defeat became evident. Bodies were found everywhere. Reno had scouts head down to make contact with Gibbon and Terry and then lead them back to their position. With the arrival of Gibbon and Terry and their contact with Reno and Benteen, the battle is over. The identifying and burial of the dead begins. 258 soldiers were killed, roughly 210 of those were with Custer. Ten civilians were also killed. Roughly 60 to 100 warriors were killed. Soldiers' graves were marked with wooden stakes. In 1877, 11 officers and two civilians were exhumed and transferred to cemeteries in the east. Custer's remains were taken to the U.S. Military Academy at West Point and buried in that cemetery. In 1881, the remains of the rest of Custer's command were collected and buried in a mass grave at the base of the memorial marker at the top of Last Stand Hill. In 1890, the Army erected 249 headstone markers across the battlefield to show the location of where Custer's men had fallen. Today, there are 252 markers, which has led to a little bit of controversy over accuracy. We're not going to get into the grave markers in great detail in this video. In 1999, the National Park Service began erecting red granite markers for known Indian warrior casualty sites around the battlefield. Since we are focusing on the reno Benteen battlefield, let's go back and walk around that position of the battlefield. Following the tour of the area, marker number one, you can look out into the valley and see the area of the valley attack by Reno and his men on the 25th. From this location, you can also see the route that they took to get to the bluffs to set up their defensive position. Marker two, marker two, you can see down into the valley and how the Indian warriors were able to make their way up to attack the troopers on the ridge. Marker 3. From here you can see the area of the depression, and this was the location of the hospital. Also, the horses and mules were kept in this area during the battle. Marker 4 is a shallow trench dug by troopers as part of a defensive position. Since there were very few shovels, most of the digging was done with knives, hatchets, spoons, and forks. To help with more protection, dead horses or mules were laid on top of the trench. Marker 5. Off in the distance, Indian warriors using captured carbines from the Custer dead occupied those ridges. Marker 6. From here, the volunteers made their way down to the river to get water for the troopers during the battle on the 26th. Marker 7 is more trenches dug by troopers during the battle. Marker 8 is the location of where Private Jones was killed, and there is a marker identifying this location. Marker 9 and 10. Benteen's line was a short distance from this location. It is here where warrior Long Road was killed during the battle. This is the area where Benteen's troops made three counterattacks on the approaching Indian warriors. Warriors were able to get close enough to the troops in this area that they could throw dirt clods on the troops. Warriors occupied all the ridges off in the distance. Marker 11 is for the Indian warrior Dog's Backbone, 
who was about 200 yards from the troops during the battle. Just as he was warning his fellow warriors to be careful of the troops' firepower, he was shot in the forehead and killed. Marker 12. From here, the troops fought from behind makeshift barricades like saddles, hardtack boxes, dead horses, and mules. In 1958, the body of one soldier was discovered, and there is a grave marker here marking the location. Markers 13 through 16 are rifle pits used by troops during the battle. Marker 17 is the location of a soldier's grave, but it is also believed that it was part of a mass grave and those bodies were collected and taken to the memorial marker on Last Stand Hill. Marker 18 is the view of Sharpshooter's Ridge in the distance. From this ridge, Indian warriors were able to fire down into the troopers' defensive position. Now if you follow the National Park Service map, here are some of the locations that you will find on that map. Tour Stop 1 is an overview of the Indian village location that is off in the distance in the valley. Tour Stop 2, 3, and 4 are all together. Stop 2 details Custer's advance from the Crow's Nest and towards the Little Bighorn. Tour Stop 3 details the valley fight with Reno's troops, and from here you can get a nice view of the area of the fight and the timber. Stop 4 details the retreat of Reno's men up the bluffs to their defensive positions. If you look closely, you will see markers for Reno's troops killed during the retreat. Tour Stop 5 is the reno Benteen Battlefield, also known as the Hilltop Defense. We have covered this already in great detail. Tour Stop 6 is Sharpshooter's Ridge. This ridge was occupied by Indian warriors that were firing down on Reno and Benteen's men. Tour Stop 7 is Weir Point. Late in the afternoon on the 25th, Captain Thomas Weir with his company comes to this area to locate Custer. The warriors, after killing all of Custer's men, attack Weir Point and drive the troopers back to the hilltop defense. Tour Stop 8 is Medicine Tail Cooley. As Custer and his men advance towards the village to start their attack, they would have moved through this area. Tour Stop 9 is Medicine Tail Ford. Here, Custer and his troops attempted to cross the Little Bighorn to get into the village. More and more warriors arrived in this area, and the troops were unable to cross the river and had to withdraw. Tour Stop 10 is Deep Cooley. As Custer engages the warriors at the riverbank, some of his men have to withdraw, and they use the Deep Cooley to move out from the area. It is at this point that the troops split. Some head towards Greasy Grass Ridge and beyond, and the others head towards the Nye Cartwright Ridge. Indian warriors would pursue both groups. Tour Stop 11 is Greasy Grass Ridge. Indian warriors that were pursuing the withdrawing troops stop on this ridge to fire on troops forming a defensive line on Calhoun Hill in the distance. Tour Stop 12 is the Lame White Man Charge. Troops from Calhoun Hill attack the warriors on Greasy Grass Ridge to break up their concentrated fire. The warriors counterattack and drive the troops back to Calhoun Hill with heavy losses. Tour Stop 11 is Calhoun Hill. From here, the troops put up a good defense, but are soon overwhelmed by attacking warriors and driven from the hilltop. It is at this point that the battle begins to turn against the troops as their defenses begin to break down. This breakdown would start the men fleeing towards Last Stand Hill. Tour Stop 14 is the Keel Crazy Horse Fight. Fleeing soldiers from Calhoun Hill move towards Keel and his men. Attacks by Crazy Horse and White Bull cut the men down. The remaining soldiers flee towards Last Stand Hill. Tour Stop 15 is Deep Ravine in the distance. Soldiers fleeing from Last Stand Hill attempt to escape the attacking warriors by running down towards Deep Ravine. There is a belief that there are no bodies of soldiers in Deep Ravine, but there are several maps both from soldier burial parties and from the warriors. There is also an eyewitness account that helped with a survey a few years after the battle. This person pinpointed the location of the soldiers' bodies. Several years ago, ground penetrating radar picked up a deep buried anomaly. It also matches the survey map location of the buried bodies. Until archaeologists check this location, the mystery will continue. Tour stop 16 and 17 is Last Stand Hill. From here you can see the markers to Custer and his command on the side of Last Stand Hill. 
Also in this area is the memorial marker for the troops killed during the battle. This is also their mass grave. The Indian Memorial is located near Lastan Hill and honors the sacrifices of the Indian warriors that died in battle. The National Park Service Visitor Center Museum is filled with artifacts and information about the battle. The Visitor Center is going to be updated very soon to enhance the visitor's experience. The National Park Service ranges are very helpful and knowledgeable. The Custer National Cemetery is located here at the Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument. Established for those killed during the battle, in 1879, General William Tecumseh Sherman issued General Order No. 78 to designate part of the battlefield as a national cemetery. Buried here are some of the veterans of the battle, including U.S. Army Indian Scouts and Marcus Reno. I hope you've enjoyed this history adventure series at Little Bighorn Battlefield National Monument.